Okay, everyone, I can see some people are still joining, but I would like to start the introduction. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first seminar in the Data Science Coast to Coast series. My name is Jing Liu, and I'm the Managing Director of the Michigan Institute for Data Science at the University of Michigan. This series is hosted jointly by six academic data science institutes. We have been planning ways to foster a broad reaching data science community that can collaborate extensively to advance our missions for research, education, and data science for social good. Using Zoom to eliminate geographical constraints, this seminar series is one of our first steps toward the goal. Um, next slide, please. I want to acknowledge my colleagues who have been organizing this series together. They are the executive directors of data science organizations. Kyle Kramer of the Morris Sloan Data Science Environment at New York University, Chris Menzel of the Stanford Data Science Initiative, Angela Wilkins of Rice University Ken Kennedy Institute, David Mongeau of the Berkeley Data Science, uh, Berkeley Institute for Data Science, and Sarah Stone, eScience Institute at University of Washington. This fall, the series features important figures in data science who will provide insight from complementary perspectives, including the transformative use of data science in traditional research disciplines, fairness and inclusion for workforce development in the age of big data, and advocacy and policy for a data enabled and just society. In the first half of 2021, the speakers will be faculty and postdocs at the six institutes. We will use these talks as the launching point of discussion that will hopefully lead to fruitful collaborative research. Next slide, please. I also want to mention a few upcoming events at these institutes. The um, Rice University Ken Kennedy Institute Annual Conference this year with healthcare research as the focus area. Berkeley Conversations on Election Integrity and Security and Consortium for Data Scientists in Training at University of Michigan featuring postdocs and graduate students uh, research presentations from 27 universities. In a second, I'm going to put the links of these events in the chat for everyone to see. At the end of today's Q&A session, I will also announce the uh, next two speakers for this seminar series. Now I will hand the mic over to my colleague, David Mondrell, for him to introduce today's speaker. David is the executive director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. With the faculty director and council, David sets strategic direction and oversees the Institute's interdisciplinary research, graduate and postdoctoral training programs, and open source software development projects. Previously, David co-led the Data Analytics Institute at Ohio State University after spending many years leading research groups David. Thank you, Jing. And welcome all. Uh, let, let me start today by encouraging you to engage with our speaker uh, by posing your questions using the Q&A Zoom feature. While you're welcome to engage with chat, uh, too, any questions submitted via Q&A will get first attention because we're expecting a fair number of questions. So there are two ways to engage. If you want your question asked, please use the Q&A feature. Dr. Talitha Washington is professor of mathematics at Clark Atlanta University and director of the Atlanta University Center Consortia Data Science Initiative. Previously, Dr. Washington served as the program director at the National Science Foundation. Her work at NSF facilitated the integration of interdisciplinary knowledge with data science using methods, including predictive artificial intelligence and economic and labor market analyses, 
leading to innovation and the development of educational technologies that connect workers with the jobs of the future. Dr. Washington was also an associate professor of mathematics at Howard University and has held other faculty positions. Overall, her experience includes innovative leadership in health, health education, research technology, I'm sorry, math education, research methodologies, and partner development. In fact, just last week, uh, Dr. Washington shared her experience with leading large partnerships to a group of national leaders in data science at the 2020 Academic Data Science Alliance uh, Data Science Leaders Meeting. Today, she'll speak more broadly about how we need to advance data science in our country. The six data science institutes from coast to coast hosting today's event are very grateful to you, Dr. Washington, to be here to share your talk, which you've entitled, Why We Can't Wait, Using Social Justice to Transform Data Science. And we're looking forward to hear how you plan to move data science toward ethics and fairness for Black Americans, because, quote, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Welcome, Talitha. Thank you, David. Great to be here, and um, thank you for having me present today. Um, if I could get the uh, share screen ball, there it is. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about um, why we can't wait. So this title came to me because it, it, Martin Luther King actually graduated from Morehouse um, College, which is in the Atlanta University Center. And he wrote this book at a time of in the 1960s, 1963, saying why we can't wait, that the urgency is now. And frankly, I'm feeling that way when it comes to data science. And when we see all the aspects with respect to machine learning, artificial intelligence and things where it impacts in particular people of color. And we can't wait to do something else and to do something better, to be frank. So as with any, um, I've been trained by the NSF to say <laughs> that all the opinions that I say today are of my own and they really don't represent or reflect the views of any organization. So just take everything I say with a grain of salt. I actually came to Spelman College as an undergraduate uh, and I initially was gonna major in engineering, but then when I found out it take, it was a three, two program, it'd take five years, I decided to do, become a math major because I thought it was easier. So I did um, undergraduate research on the stability of difference equations with a professor over at Clark Atlanta University who now is my colleague and who we have published multiple papers together. As an undergraduate, I also played in the Morehouse marching band. So we're, we're co-located right across the street. So there's a Spelman and Morehouse tradition where we get um, Spelman sisters, get Morehouse brothers. Spelman's all female, Morehouse is all males. So we get just a Morehouse brother and, and we do a lot of activities together. The fall of my junior year, I went to study abroad in Mexico and that was the first time I took a statistics course. <laughs> so it was actually in Mexico in Spanish. After Spelman, I went on to graduate school at the University of Connecticut. It was pretty daunting going from a smaller liberal arts college to a huge you know, R1 uh, research institution. To my surprise, there was a Spelman grad there who was over the African-American Cultural Center who really helped make that connection. And so, it, you know, we, graduates of historically black colleges and universities, we have like this whole big family where we can just like go somewhere and we know if they're connected with us either by we went to the same school or it's in the historically black college and university family, we, we feel good and we feel better about the place. So she was really a great advocate there. So um, like David said, I, I've kind of been around. I'm originally from Indiana and went to undergrad at Spelman grad school at UConn. Then I did a postdoc at, at Duke. My area, I'm an applied mathematician. I like looking at dynamical systems and modeling. I then went up to College New Rochelle, University of Evansville, 
Howard University, NSF, and now um, in my current position, I've returned back home in a way uh, to at the Atlanta University Center. So it, I always think about, you know, when people say, well, how did I get into data science? I, I honestly got pulled into data science by my students. My, I like scientific computing. I like applied. I like figuring out how things work and I enjoy programming. So my students would literally pull me by the ear and say, Dr. Washington, let's go do some data science. I said, okay. So I, I got more into it with my students. And uh, that's my uh, graduate student there in the middle. He's uh, now does machine learning for JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and I also was a part of the Park City Math Institute the summer that where we looked at developing curriculum guidelines for undergraduate programs in data science. That was a great experience. And at the NSF, I was over the improving undergraduate STEM education over the data science component. So I really got a chance to see what does data science look like at a national level and who's doing what. And on the right, that's just a random STEM card, just because, and, and you know, I wear a mask. <laughs> so I, I come, I got tapped on the shoulder and I've been here in Atlanta since the middle of August. So I'm about 60 days into my new job, trying to figure out, well, okay, what has been done and, and what, what will we do and how we do it and the impacts that we will have. The model for Atlanta University is one that resonates with me. It says, I'll find a way or make one. And so this really kind of, it positions how at least I'm thinking about data science. We'll, we either find a way or we're gonna make it. We're just gonna construct it. So the Atlanta University Center is a 90 year old consortium of four historically black colleges that primarily serve black students. So to some total is 9,000. Each institution is its own institution, but we come together around um, cross registration, um, different strategies on handling COVID and, and other things. So the four institutions are Clark Atlanta University, which is a co-ed comprehensive research university. It's an R2. They have a strong school of business, social work, they're co-ed. There's also Morehouse College, which is all males. It's about um, 2,200 students, liberal arts college. And they are pride themselves on developing men with disciplined minds who will lead lives of leadership and service. There's also Morehouse School of Medicine, which is graduate school, which is about 675 students. And they really lead in fulfilling the social mission to train black doctors and also placement of doctors in underserved communities. And Spelman College, which is all women, is a liberal arts college, and they really have impacted the number of African-American women who have gone on to get PhDs in STEM, me being one of them. So, but it's interesting to navigate a data science initiative across four institutions, and I answered a four provosts and four presidents who are all amazing and fantastic, and they all have different perspectives and in institutional needs. So I, I have to constantly flex between the different institutions and make sure that the D, our initiative is pliable, robust and pliable at the same time. So it's responsive to each of the institutions. The, insti the institutions are co-located, meaning literally right across the street. And we have a strong history in the Atlanta University Center of actually developing, cultivating um, leaders who have been involved in the civil rights movement and also current emerging leaders as of now. So on the right is a picture of Julian Bond. He's about 23 years old in this picture. And that's him and his office staff with um, SNCC. So, I, and Martin Luther King graduated from there. And if I listed everybody that graduated from the Atlanta University Center who is active in civil rights, we'd be here for a long time. So we don't have time for that. But the Atlanta University Center really has a long history of cultivating that spirit of the students really going out and speaking for rights and, and defining what it means to have equal rights in society. So we have a case for data science. We, so the presidents of the um, institutions, the Atlanta University Center came together and said it would be beneficial for our students to have skills in data science. And to be frank, the workplace now requires more skills in data science. So how can we, equip and prepare all of our students for these jobs that do exist now and for jobs that don't even yet exist. It's because there's a high demand for that skill. Just in Georgia alone, um, it's, you know, a hot career in Georgia is that all undergraduate degrees, except coaches and scouts, but I'm sure they could use data science, 
and again, kindergarten teachers, how to work activity of process and analyze data information as a component, as a core component. So this the idea of processing or analyze data information really transcends multiple uh, career paths. And also, if we think about upward economic mobility of our students, it can also help our students attain higher paying jobs. It, our students are mostly Black students, and we recognize that there is an access issue for both Black and Latino students with access to high-level science and math in, in the K through 12 system. So calculus is offered in 33% of high schools with high Black and Latino enrollment and 56% of high schools with low Black and Latino enrollment. So our students come from a place of, they may not have had access to science and math that let's say other folks may have. So oftentimes at HBCUs, we will get what some people will call underprepared students, but it's really not underprepared. It's, it's students that didn't have the access because of, well, social constructs and things. And so our job as educators really is to take them, meet them where they are and quickly accelerate and get, and get them up to speed. And to be frank, we can't lose any of any of our students. So we have he, historically bought colleges and universities. They were established, are their institutions that were established prior to 1964 with the principal mission of educating Black Americans. And depending on how you count, there's about 9,903. It's depending on how you count um, HBCUs, and they make up 2.3 of all 2.3 percent of all institutions of higher education and enroll about 11.6% of all black students in higher education. Now, even though it's 11.6 or 10, 10 to 11, the numbers can change. I think the 11.6 was a little bit older number, but HBCUs graduate about 25% of black students with STEM degrees, even though they only enroll about 10 or 11% of all black students. So HBCUs in this case over enroll or over enroll Black students with STEM degrees. And also HBCUs are the institution of origin of almost 30% of Black graduates in STEM doctoral programs. Whenever I go hang out at math meetings, data science meetings, and hang out with other uh, Black professionals, most of us did come from HBCUs and we share stories. And so the idea is that if we're looking at diversifying the data science field and those who have skills in data science, HBCUs are well positioned to make that impact and really uh, meet that demand. So I'm just posting this up just because last weekend it was a whole bunch of frenzy on Facebook about homecoming and things. And so this post, some people ask me, what is it about HBCUs that we, we are able to train, we are able to entice students to go into STEM and just be successful? What, what is that secret sauce? And I think really is that secret sauce is that we provide an atmosphere where students can be themselves. They don't have to be the, the colored kid or they don't have to be tagged. They can be a person and they don't have to carry on all of these racial weights around with them when they come to class. So this was just a, a random posting. If you wonder why HBCU alumni go so hard for their homecoming, it's because HBCUs represent the four years in our lives in which we weren't the minority, an affinity group or an afterthought. It's a black sacred ground. On the right hand side in the upper right, that's me with a uh, one of my classmates there who also has a PhD, Ayana, and we were just doing the math of skipping rope with John Conrad. And, you know, we both have PhDs. And the picture below that, it was a couple of years ago, that was the Spelman math department and some of my classmates. So there's a really big familial um, atmosphere around, let's say, in my case, mathematics at Spelman. But also the picture down here in the middle uh, one of my classmates from high school, I was walking up the street when I was at Howard University and I was like, are you Micah Johnson's son? And he was like, yeah. I was like, how are you? And so there's that familial thing that happens at HBCU that's natural, that we can grab onto other people's children and raise them up to become professionals and successful. So for the AUC Data Science Initiative Plan, we, kinda, we have four components that we're looking at developing. First, we wanna make sure that our data science is open to all of our students across Atlanta University Center. We want all of our students to acquire some form of data science literacy. We also want to be a hub for other HBCUs, other institutions, so that we can leverage and build on these multidisciplinary and multi-institutional strengths. 
The third aspect is inclusion. We wanna include faculty and we wanna support and help develop our faculty. We also wanna expand the, the teaching of data science, either through minors, um, courses, and we wanna do this in a way that's collaborative across institutions. Even though we're separated by streets, th that street can be really wide um, it, it conceptually. And our fourth is partners, developing meaningful partners with either professional societies, those in industry, federal government, and other academic institutions. So we're seeing that this data science initiative will rest on these four slices. When I came in a couple months ago, I did what any good data scientist would do. I did a qualitative analysis of what everybody thought that the data science initiative should be, should do, and, did, and clustered everything together and kind of whittled it down. It's almost like making maple syrup, whittled it down to a sweet maple syrup with these two goals. Our first goal of the data science initiative is to develop talent. We're kind of, we're being bold. We wanna be the largest producer of African-Americans with expertise and credentials in data science. And we wanna ensure that every student has access to data science experiences. So not the pipeline, but pathways. We wanna develop pathways into data science at the K through 12 level, the undergraduate level, professionals in the workplace, and also provide pathways for our faculty to engage in data science. Those who are already there, and also those who want to come into data science but haven't yet had the opportunity. We are engaging with them as well. Our second goal is to create new knowledge. We want to lead national efforts to address race, gender, and social justice aspects of data science. For HBCUs and the Atlanta University Center in particular, the idea of social justice is in our DNA. It's what we do every day. It's almost like breathing. We don't think about what we're doing, we just do it. And so we really, I really wanna make sure that we develop these evidence-based practices, develop the research that really speaks to bringing light to topics that impact black America. So our data science initiative, we're thinking about, uh, in doing, bringing diversity to science. So in this diagram, we have industry, students, faculty. So we're seeing collaborations with industry where industry partners can inform, design, do guest lectures, provide real, real world applications. Also, we um, leverage our faculty expertise and we really rely on faculty to lead the development of either work pathways, to enhance new curriculum or launch new program. And also, and we want to engage our students in meaningful research, training opportunities, and we expect that our students will go out and diversify the workforce and will be the leaders in data science. So that's what we're aiming for. So we have been developing academic programs. One of them is we've been developing an undergraduate course. It's akin to the uh, Berkeley Data Science, for, data science B Berkeley Data 8. I can't say it right. Data 8 course. We're calling it data science for all because we really want it to be a, a course that's for all students, regardless of how you come into the institutions. We're also developing a graduate course at Clark Atlanta that's grounded in the social sciences. Um, so it's an infusion of social science with data science and, and creating that synergy. With the Warner School of Medicine, we're creating a, course, a boot camp, a summer boot camp on data science that looks more at health applications. So health analytics and things. We're also developing a minor. So if you think about developing a minor at one institution, it's a lot of work. We're, it's at three institutions and it's gonna be a lot of fun work. So we're in the midst of developing that and bringing that uh, to fruition. So we've also been doing other curriculum development and data management. This past summer, we funded faculty to um, develop either course modules or develop new courses. And we had about 29 faculty participated in developing um, new courses over the summer and we've been engaging with them. So we're really excited to see the items that they have developed. In developing our data science minor, we are looking for our students to use statistical packages, right? to acquire, prepare, analyze, and visualize. And also we want them to use data science models. The question is, well, how should we do this with what data sets and things? And what we want is data sets that really speak to the experience of our students, so our, 
really data sets that are grounded in the African American experience, which means that we're going to have to develop them. So that, that's in the queue, right? That we will be working on developing these course modules and course components that really looks at data sets, but they really speak to the African American experience. We also want them to be able to explain ethical, societal, economics concerns for managing data and applying data science practices. And we want them to be well-versed in the data science project life cycle. We're seeing our data science minor as a way to give students a wider knowledge base uh, for their major. It's almost like an enhancement of their major. So this minor pathway, it's going to, we're looking to have it at three different institutions Three of our four institutions have undergraduate programs. And so what, we've, what we're doing is we're gonna have a team from Clark Atlanta, team from Morehouse, team from Spelman that will develop the data science minor, but we'll also bring in the Morehouse School of Medicine and the library so that we ensure cross fertilization across the Atlanta University Center. In all that we do, we really wanna proceed in a collaborative way it's not just one institution doing something, it's really the collaborative. There's a gentle balance between respecting each institution individually and also leveraging the collective. So that's, that's a strategy that is, is ongoing, but it's been really fruitful to have the different perspectives of the institutions at the table and working together. This past summer, we had an undergraduate research program uh, between Clark Atlanta and Spelman where students work with faculty on data sets and they did research projects on these data sets and did presentations. The topics varied anywhere from data in the humanities to racial diversity and medical research to exploration of suicide rates using data science to data in natural sciences and mathematics. So just a whole bunch of different uh, types of projects for the students to develop and really just get their feet wet into exploring data sets and what can we say about them. These, um, the summer research experience, as you probably can imagine, was online and also it provided our students an opportunity to do something over the summertime. And we really were excited about their results and the findings that they created. We've also been busy in engaging faculty and, and students We've been, our faculty, you know, I, I feel for faculty because during this pandemic, it, it, to be frank, it's, it's hard. It's hard. That, and that's an understatement about the burden that faculty are carrying. But I'm very impressed that our faculty are still engaged. They want to do more boot camps. They want to do workshops. They want to lead research projects. And they are doing this. So I've, I've been really uh, pleased to have the, to work alongside with the faculty. We have uh, 20 members attended uh, workshops over the summer. They've done, we have supported online courses and we're rolling out new programs that will help faculty um, as they either do data science or come into data science. Informing the data science initiative, before I came, um, folks from the Atlanta University Center and faculty went to different um, institutes. One that's Berkeley. And they, they went around and looked at, well, what could work and, and how can we do this? And also, is this something we should do? I think that with these visits, it really resonated that, that this needs to be done because when they entered into the different institutes, they didn't see representation of African-Americans. I think it just really um, struck the, the presidents that if we don't do it, it, it won't get done. So there, there's a, a mission there and a passion for really kind of amplifying the field. I've been, we've been really blessed by the different institutes and in sharing knowledge uh, and sharing uh, different plans as we build our programs. So I've really enjoyed being in the community. We are also working on developing connections with industry. We want to engage, we have engaged with industry around, you know, curriculum design, real world applications, we're looking at potential faculty and externships where faculty go um, to industry. We also have industry folks come in and, and teach classes with us. So, but we're looking at building that out on a broader scale. Since I've been here, I've only been here two months, um, we, we have had a lot of industry folks really wanna partner. 
but you know, I'm kind of finding all the virtual water fountains, so to speak. So, but hopefully soon we will have an industry partnership program that really is mutually beneficial, not just a one-way recruiting mechanism, but we can benefit them and they can benefit us. So the Atlanta University Center is ideally positioned as a data science hub. Atlanta is really rich in a data science industry. And also we can leverage the AUC's history in social justice. And the initiative really aims to increase the number of graduates with skills in data science. And the idea, the thread really is that we bring together all the institutions from across the Atlanta University Center to, to develop this together. So this really is a center-wide initiative between four different institutions. Now, our governance structure is the following. We have a, you can think of our governing board, that's the AUCC Council of Provosts and also the director of the library. So the, so, you know, if you say, well, I just answer to one institution, I answer to four, four provosts, <laughs> which, which, which is actually a lot of fun because they are behind the data science initiative. They want it successful and they see the value. And that's really a key component. And I also work with the executive director, Todd Green, who's been in grade and guiding and the project manager, Bettina Gardner, who is meticulous with every detail. So it's a, a great team to really work with to advance a data science initiative. We also have a faculty council, which is made up of faculty from across the institutions and the library. Um, so this faculty council, we rely on them. What are we doing? How should we do it? What, what, what frankly should we be doing? And so we ha typically have monthly meetings where we check in with them. So some key accomplishments to date. Well, I was hired in mid-August. We're hoping that our data science minor will launch in the fall of 2021. And we're going to um, roll out some introductory data sciences courses at the graduate levels. We have graduate data science fellows from both Clark Atlanta and Morehouse School of Medicine. More than 80 faculty, and I think that number is too low now, more than 80 faculty have completed some data science related training. And the faculty, when they do this, they did online training and some of them created their own cohorts where they got together after the training to talk about what they did all virtually. So there's, there's an excitement from the faculty in doing data science. We have impacted more than 300 students, both at the high school graduate and undergraduate levels. Also momentum at Morehouse um, with Dr. Kenneth Gaucher impacted adult learners. So they had a boot camp, a coding boot camp for those in a workplace. And so what we're looking at doing is really building up these activities to create these pathways into data science, either for those who are already in data science or those who want to come to data science. Across Atlanta University Center, the institutions are, are very busy with data science, but this is just a, a, some random examples, a snapshot view. So Spelman College, they have a grant that, and they engage with US Army Research Lab to support faculty and student training with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's in the Department of Mathematics. And they're in the process of developing a course on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Morehouse College has a course, it's called Engage Computing, CSC 480, that invites those from industry, maybe Dell, Home Depot, PayPal, et cetera. They co-teach the class with people from industry in that the industry person teaches the content the person on the Morehouse side, they, you know, they do the grading part and, and those sorts of things. They're the, the instructor on record. But having this course uh, between Morehouse and people from industry brings industry closer to what the students are learning in the classroom. And they've seen a lot of great success with that. Clark Atlanta University has a center for cancer research and therapeutic development. And at, at this center, one of the research thrusts is in bioinformatics and large-scale genome-wide association data analysis. Morehouse School of Medicine has an integrated biomedical informatics unit. And in this unit, they bridge healthcare data, patient outcomes data, and so on, to really figure out, well, how can we do healthcare better? Or how can we do predictions better? They're also going to be soon rolling out a health informatics um, masters in bioinformatics. So really exciting. 
We also, on October 29th, this is a, a quick infomercial, the Atlanta University Center is going to host a cybersecurity virtual summer. And this is also sponsored by the Data Science Initiative. So we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and how data science impacts all of this. So at this cybersecurity summit, we're gonna talk about cybersecurity, but also the interplay with data and how to keep you safe, both if you're just an individual or in an organization. So we're really excited about this um, virtual summit that's coming up, registration is free. And if you can't find it, let me know, I can always send it later, but we're really excited about this. And this was an, this is initiative between the chief information officers across the AUC institutions. So I've been meeting with them weekly to help um, bring this conference to fruition, but it's been really great to be able to work with provosts, faculty, students, chief information officers, development officers, you know, everybody across the Atlanta University Center. So also we have, we have friends at other HBCUs that are doing things in data science. This is just a quick snapshot view of some happenings in data science at, at other institutions. Bowie State University, which is in Maryland, they have a data science and analytics initiative it's funded by NSF to infuse data science analytics into undergrad courses, research opportunities, and they also have faculty learning communities. They're working on developing course modules there. Fisk University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, they are the first dedicated undergraduate data science program at an HBCU as well as the state of Tennessee. So they are, they're really ambitious in um, developing data science at the institution. North Carolina A&T just rolled out a comp computational data science and engineering PhD program, and they also have a master's program. That's in North Carolina, Greensboro. And North Carolina Central, which is in Durham, they just this summer launched a major in information technology with a concentration in data analytics. So across looking at the across the HBCU landscape, more and more HBCUs are developing programs in data science and in different ways. North Carolina Central is coming out of the School of Business. Uh, Fisk is at, at an institutional level. It, Bowie's institutional. Howard's is out of engineering. It's really neat to see how the institutions are interpreting data science and then providing those opportunities for students and faculty. So I'm just going to pivot does uh, allow me to pivot for a moment, just kind of what, what kind of strikes me about data analysis and, and what was the, the points where, where I said, I, I have to do something about this, right? It was, it just, data science for me became a must. Well, a few years ago, back in 2016, I attended a workshop at ISERM. I love ISERM, by the way. It's an NSF funded math institute. At, it's held on the campus of Brown University. At this workshop, it was on predictive policing. Now this past summer with all of the happenings, you can provide your own adjective, with all the happenings uh, with the policing and things of that nature, uh, I thought that it was important to actually talk about it because at that workshop, I was the only US minority there. I remember before applying and I looked, I looked at all the, the people there and I told my friend, I said, there are no African-Americans on there. Should I go? He's like, probably not a good idea. <laughs> I went anyway. And it was, it was hard. It, it was hard because we looked at policing data and it would bring me back to Center City, Evansville, Indiana, where literally we would kind of get run down by the police. Uh, and usually it was more of the black males that would be targets for police than black females. I remember even my brother had bite marks on his leg for a canine chasing him down. So when I went there, I went with the understanding that the people who are impacted by the police, this, this is my family, this is my friend, this is my community. But in, when I was in that room, I didn't feel that. And when we look at data, it's important to understand where this data comes from and who it impacts. At this workshop, uh, there were different topics. There was police patrol analysis, dynamic prediction of crime events and patterns, criminal networks, big and small, crowds and social unrest, social media and hate. I ended up um, on the police patrol analysis looking at calls for service. We also did a ride along with a, and that's me with the police officer there. But I found that towards the end of the week, it was, it got, it was hard. It, 
this data science wasn't hard, that being in the conversations was hard. And yeah, so this is what I looked at. This is just an example. We, we literally got 911 data and we, we, we were told here, have fun with it, do something with it. So one thing that I did was I created a heat map to look at noise disturbances and where it was. And if you look at 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., which is in the upper left, you see a red spot. That's Providence College. So I guess they're partying. So it kind of looks at the noise disturbances and different components. And I remember bringing up to the group, I said, do you think we should look at response times and how that differs in um, different zip codes or areas? Because in my, you know, from my experience, where I come from, some people say you can get uh, Papa John's pizza faster than you can get uh, the police coming to your door. You may not want Papa John's pizza, but that's another story. Uh, so, and so I, I said, you know, coming from my experience, you know, there's a song by Flavor Flay, Public Enemy, 911 is a joke. So I wanted to look at it, where was that racial disparity in these calls? My voice was clearly drowned out by the group because I was a voice of one. And my experience in look, asking those questions differed from the rest of the group. And so it, by the end of the week, I was, I was ready to go. It, it wasn't, it, I do not blame the organizers. I love ISERM. Everybody's amazing. It was just for me being in that room and not having that equalizer of really looking at what are the racial implications of what we're doing and how we're doing it, that it made it, it was difficult. Because when we look at these, if we look at this lower diagram, in data science, oftentimes we're given, we're given or we have to construct some sort of data set. The data set we're given or what we're constructing could inherently come with our own biases. And sometimes we look for things to confirm our biases, not to look for things that actually inform what is happening or not happening. So, you know, we get the data set, we analyze the data, and when we analyze the data, we could do software searches or we could search for patterns and correlations, oftentimes that go with our thinking. So how do we, and then we make predictive maps and maybe this could lead to increased surveillance. So it, when I was at that workshop, you know, being the only U US Negro there I, and having my voice kind of really be the oddball in the room, it became kind of smack me in my face that if, if I don't do this or if I don't bring other people into this fold, not, not people on the periphery to inform, but people who are actually doing the data science, who are asking the questions and who are investigating, creating the models, that these models are really gonna go bad very quickly when it comes to um, ethics, bias and, and amplifying. Um, because so at this, um, after the workshop, I looked up predictive policing models and there was one pred pool in Oakland that where it had a predictive policing model and it said that individuals classified as a race other than white or black would receive targeted police at a rate 1.5 times that of whites. So, it, so for me, these, these models could predict more of people's biases versus predict the reality. And so in my mind is how do we make sure that that doesn't happen? So as a director of the data science initiative at the Atlanta University Center, this past May, um, two of our students from Morehouse, uh, hopefully I don't get emotional here, were tased on live television. So when we talk about policing data, when we talk about being targets of AI, ML, and the misuse, it's not really somebody else or somebody that is way over there. This is our, these are our students at, in the Atlanta University Center. These are our faculty that get directly impacted. Back in 1960, a group of students from the Atlanta University Center wrote a manifesto that appeared in the Atlanta uh, General Constitution. It was an appeal for human rights. It said, it is unfortunate that the Negro is being forced to fight in any way for what is due to him and is freely accorded to other Americans. So our, our struggle for justice and for not for being heard and for actually making sure we're at the table, making the decisions along with other people is, is still continues. So our data science initiative, it spans over the four institutions and the library. And we're really looking to bring lights on issues that impact our students so that we can, to be frank, protect our students and also impact our faculty. And we are, were funded um, initially with seed money from the United Health Group. 
So what are we working on? Everything, right? So, so I'm, I'm still at, um, I guess, 60 days. And we're working on, still have to hire, developing a management system, working on developing partnership structures with external entities. What does that look like? I'm also working on a fundraising plan and in coordination with the development offices across the Atlanta University Center, working on building up infrastructure. Uh, we, we, we have needs like high performance computing, virtual labs, and so on. Working on developing a communication plan and rolling out projects and activities and much, much more. Now on the left-hand side, I have Dr. Dubois there, Dubois there who was at Atlanta University and, you know, oftentimes when I do this work, it, it, I don't do it in isolation. I do it with the, the ancestors before me kind of looking to make sure, are you doing right by, by us? And, and are you really moving us in the right direction? So the goal really is to position the data science initiative on the legacy of the Atlanta University Center so that we can really make these positive changes. So with that, thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me to give this presentation and I will take any questions and also a thank you to United Health Group for funding us. Thank you, um, Talitha. There are actually quite a few questions. Um, you've given us some powerful personal uh, experience that spoke loudly and uh, the ambitions of what you're accomplishing in Atlanta are, 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 are something to see. I do wanna try and get to as many of these questions as possible. So I'm going to start. Um, first, uh, Dr. Washington, in addition to issues on access, how might self-identity like stereotype threat affect the career pathways towards data science? Yeah, so when I was at NSF, I actually had the pleasure of meeting um, Dr. Claude Steele, who was at Berkeley, Stanford. I'm gonna get it wrong. Claude Steele, who actually formed this whole idea of stereotype threat. And I remember when he came to NSF, I'll, I'll tell it with a longer story. When I was at NSF, I was the co-lead of the Hispanic Serving Institutions Program. I'm, I'm not Hispanic and let's, let's, so I could say these, I'm not at the foundation anymore. Um, I, I had a coworker come up to me and they were like, you, you should let the other co-lead speak more. And I was like, why? He said, because she's, you know, and she meant Hispanic. I was like, wait. And so I had, so that was the direct um, racial or ethnic uh, thrust. And so I started getting, personally, I started thinking, wait, should I be doing this? You know, what's going on? You know, I had lived in Costa Rica, I lived in Mexico, you know, so I had this whole uh, interracial, interethnic uh, viewpoint. And when Claude Steele came, it was like he unpacked layers uh, around my thinking. So I, I, stereotype threat is real. And sometimes, Sometimes when we are uh, a black professional or black student or what have you, driving while black, we get all of these stereotypes and, and garbage that gets tossed at us. And sometimes we internalize them and we start to believe them until somebody, let's say like Claude Steele comes along and says, no, this isn't you. You're not getting the feedback that you want because of this whole dynamic that doesn't have anything to do with you. And so having somebody check that is very helpful. And, and also sometimes I can't, I can't see when somebody is throwing stereotypes at me because it happens so often. It's almost like, um, not, not to underscore, but it's almost like an abused child where they don't know that they're being abused because that's their reality. And so having other people in the room saying, hey, I think they're talking over you a little too much. It's like, oh, it's not me, it's, it's the other person. Having those outside perspectives, at least for me, is, is very helpful in combating stereotype threat. And I also tend to do that for my students. I tell them, no, you're good, you're gonna do this. And I see you have this specific skill, A, B, C, and I, I'm very specific and nope, we're gonna do this and get it done. I believe in you and I'm very direct. Yeah, so. Thank you. In maybe in, 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 in a similar um, 
space that we need to be concerned about. There's a question here uh, addressing the comments you've made about data being biased and AI models being biased. The question is, how are models biased? Is it by using demographics? And what are the ways bias can be re removed from AI models? We all come with our own bias. And I, I see modeling as almost like um, art. So let's say an artist sees, sees a picture of the ocean and then they interpret that and they, they paint it. They interpret the, the, what they see, the reality of what they see. Oftentimes with modeling or may, during predictive modeling, interpreting data, in a way we're kind of painting what we see. And sometimes what we see could be filtered through what we know. And so it's not necessarily, so numbers themselves aren't biased, right? Two plus two can be five, whatever, right? So numbers themselves aren't biased. It's what we bring. We, we are humans. We bring our whole self into what we do. We're thinking through, should it be this? Should it be that? What should be the switches? What should be the right logical process? And when our thinking comes into it, because we are thinking beings and we love to think and it's fun, sometimes that could propagate biases. And so, at least in my mind, if we can have different people in the conversation and value these different viewpoints, that could help circumvent the biases that we all bring. I have biases, I have a lot of them, trust me, I do. And, but that's why I also like to have a lot of people around me who will say, wait a minute, what about this? Or what about that? And I'll say, oh, I didn't think about that or teach me more about that perspective. I really don't know. And so it's, so I hope that that's helpful is that the numbers themselves aren't biased. It's what we bring into the conversation. It's what we bring into the models, how we do the interpretation, how are we telling the story and how, what are we expecting the story to tell from, let's say a data set that we're trying to extract some information from. Great. Thinking, moving now maybe to more to some of the curriculum issues and um, a question here. Morehouse College received attention for creating the first and only degree in software engineering. Does that program intersect with your initiative? And secondly, where in general does software coding skills development play in this work? So yeah, so Morehouse has a the first for software engineering. And the course that I talked about that brings in industry partners, that's actually taught by computer science. And so we've been working with computer science and thinking about different ways that we can explore either doing coding, bringing industry into play. And programming comes is in data science in that we, we want students to go in and actually develop code that can interact with data and do something with the data. So we have it. So this almost sounds like a, a Morehouse grad, right? But we are engaging. <laughs> I'm a spell the night, so I could say those sorts of random things. But we are engaging uh, with the computer science. I, you know, I, I'm at 60 days sort of thing. I am still making rounds, uh, talking with everybody and trying to learn who's who and what's what. So if there's some information that you think I should know, send me an email, call me. Yeah. And, and, and similarly, you mentioned um, students coming in and learning your words were software, um, statistical software packages and so on. It, in addition to these packages, where does open source um, software fit in data science? That's a good question. So, so I'm across four institutions with four different um, viewpoints around technology. So Spelman has, every, every student has to take a technology course. So does uh, Morehouse and Clark Atlanta has it embedded in one of the, the gen eds. Um, Morehouse School of Medicine, I'm not sure if they have a technology uh, requirement, but we do have, we do work with open source and we are actually do, working with the library to develop um, open source either either programs or data or modules that we can actually publish and share on the library's website. So we're working with them to try to get our stuff like out in the public domain and, and shareable. 
Okay, great. And that's helpful. I, I think you've given us a good lead into another question that came in about the libraries. Um, if you'll give me a second here. Um, thank you for so much for your presentation. This work is exemplary for data democratization. My question, the, the person posing this question, um, I'm very interested to hear about your partnerships with libraries. Did librarians teach data literacy? Did they provide access to data sets or provide guidance and access or data management? What was their role? So the library has been very excited and very involved, very engaged. So they are providing a, uh, data management structure. And so we're working to develop that. They are also hosting a series of workshops for the AUC around data science, um, either coding, they have another one coming up in, in a couple of weeks, uh, boot camp. And, you know, the library, in all honesty, is a separate 501c3. So you can also become a friend of the library if you want to engage with their programs, you know, quasi infomercials every, every now and then. So people can, so the library is very open in that you can become a friend of the library and it's, well, now, now we have internet, it's open to everyone. But they've been very involved in, we want to make sure that we are providing the resources, either if it's data storage, finding data, um, instructional tools, research tools, they, they are in those conversations and they're working alongside with us to develop what that is and what that looks like. And they've actually, um, so Justin De La Cruz is at working with us and his title now has data in his title. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he's in the library. So we see them Great. as a natural partner in doing data science. Great. And maybe then our, our last question um, with the time we have allowed, and it, it goes back to the title of, of your talk today. Um, in what ways can data science be used in an entrepreneurial setting with regard to social justice? What do you mean entrepreneurial setting? I'm, I will guess that the person who asked this question was thinking we talked a lot about academia and, and established industry, but maybe not in um, innovation, new startups and so on. Oh, okay. So when I worked at the um, National Science Foundation, I worked in the Convergence Accelerator that worked with startups. So I, I badly put everybody together. We, we actually would like to work with startups. Startups oftentimes have access to data that we don't have. And so there is, a, there is an opportunity for startups to engage in data science because there's just so much that needs to be done. And also to look at some of the socially relevant aspects of data science to help move the, the field forward and to round it out. So I see startups and entrepreneurship along with data science so that we can really package these things and, and build up what does it mean to bring social justice to data science in a meaningful way not something with just some coloration but something with something behind it that's really grounded in evidence research and to be frank grounded in people thank you very much um, for ans the, the answers to these questions i think they've opened up even more questions uh, dr washington there are there are there are other questions and perhaps we they could be, we may be able to address them in the future. Um, thank you for letting us record your session. We know people will want to come back to it. Very much appreciate from the six universities involved that you took this time and, and shared all the uh, insights you did today. I wanted to close by um, letting you offer a closing word and then going back to Jing Lu, who will end our session today. Okay, let me share with my slide and uh, just give people an idea of what's coming up. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending today's seminar. It's very inspiring. So next month we have Dr. Alex, Alex Zaleh, who's a professor in, at the Johns Hopkins University. He's one of the most influential astronomers, cosmologists of our time, and he helped transform astronomy into a data science. He's also a rock star, literally. Um, November 18th, three o'clock Eastern noon uh, Pacific time. 
In December, December 15th, same time, we have Dr. Jean Holm. She is currently the chief data officer for the city of Los Angeles. She's a very strong opponent, a proponent for uh, open data and open science through her work both at the White House and the World Bank. She was also the chief knowledge architect for NASA. So I hope many of you will be able to join uh, for both the November and the December event. All right, with this, uh, I'd like to close today's seminar and thank you again, Dr. Washington.